helping you. Um, Patrick Harper, Harper participates on the Federal Open Market Committee, which sets our nation's monetary policy. He's president uh, and chief executive officer of the Philadelphia Federal Reserve Bank. I invite you to his bio in the book to learn more about President Harper's distinguished career and how he affects uh, our everyday lives. I do want to say that when President Harper accepted our invitation to keynote this event, we were overjoyed. Uh, we were overjoyed because we believe that there was no one more qualified to provide insight on this topic than he is. Uh, this is because immediately before uh, becoming Philly Fed President, he was President of the University of Delaware. Before Delaware, he was Dean of the Wharton School of Business at the University of Pennsylvania. And also because he has a PhD, I believe, in civil engineering. <laughs> President Harker's, I suspect that President Harker's comments will reflect his unique combination of on-point experiences as a central banker, university president, business school dean, and civil engineer. And with that, I just have to say, we're doing a lot of engineer for us today. <laughs> <laughs> All righty. Well, thanks. And again, uh, Welcome to the Philly Club, and uh, thanks so much for having me today. So when I looked at today's agenda, I noticed that it covered a lot of what I wanted to address. Which both assures me I won't wander too far afield from what you're interested in, but also it runs the risk of repetition. So I think I'll start with something I know no one else has said so far, the standard Fed disclaimer. I have to start every speech of this. So the views I express today in my alone do not reflect anyone else, whether the Fed, the Federal Reserve System, or the Federal Open Market Committee. There, no one else said that. So, uh, so I do have a privilege to perhaps occur, as Peter says, of a number of perspectives on higher education. I spent a long time in academia, both in teaching and administration, as a first generation college student, and the panel of three millennial children, one of whom just uh, finished his MBA at Wharton. So acknowledging that I like to have some unconscious biases informed by each of these experiences, and I do have some conscious ones, but I'll probably keep quiet on those, uh, I'm going to speak today from the monetary policymaker's perch and focus on the impact of higher education in the larger context of the American economy. Today I'd like to address the environmental nature of the labor market, the changing realities for higher education and employment, and employers, and the implication of the sum of those parts. Before that, however, I'd like to set some specific parameters for my remarks. Specifically, what I see is the fundamental purpose of higher education. I want to start out just to dispense with the debate over its aim being either the preparation for work or the intellectual pursuit of a more and better and well-examined life. Because I think it actually creates a false sense of mutual exclusivity. Higher education should absolutely help prepare students for a career after graduation. And, as technology advances at a more and more rapid pace, rethinking how to do that remains essential. And that doesn't mean abandoning the arts and humanities. In fact, as I'll explain in my later, I think it actually makes the case for their importance. And while the phrase higher education tends to elicit images of bricks, brick walls, ivy, ivy covered walls, it also contains and consists of a range of post-secondary options from community colleges to technical schools to training programs, which are critically important to play a central role in our evolving labor market. All of these, whether they lead to the practical or the philosophical, help students develop life skills, accumulate knowledge, and appreciate learning for its own sake. There are two overwhelming factors influencing higher education's future, demographics and technology. Demography is observed force on a number of areas in the economy, including, including labor force participation. The current participation rate is significantly lower than it was a decade ago. And research by our staff in Philadelphia indicates that this trend will likely continue. As we, the baby boomers, head into retirement, well, we will be the largest generation in history to do so. That means more people rely on Social Security and Medicare than ever before, and since we're also a little longer, that we're doing it for an extended period of time. The millennial generation is actually a bit larger than the boomers. But even the oldest millennials are not quite in their prime earning years. So the share of the population paying into those programs is waiting toward the less affluent end of the spectrum. We're also not 
assume a great boom in population. As we all know, economics is full of equations that utilize the entirety of the Greek alphabet. But then one of the most important laws of economics, it's a very simple sum. Growth in the labor force plus growth in productivity equals economic growth, long-run economic growth. So those two variables. Is productivity also meaning that the overall growth potential for the country is affected? So I make a note here that we could be miscalculating, though, productivity. We think it's low, we think it's low globally, but we might be miscalculating it. One of our economists here, Lenny Nakamura, has done extensive research on how technology has affected our understanding of productivity, which is notoriously difficult to measure in the first place, particularly in industries like service industries, like healthcare and so forth, where you can't even measure output. If you can't measure output, you can't measure productivity. What is not difficult to measure, however, is population growth. And without more people, it will be harder for the economy to expand. Trends in demographics affect the people who have a stake in education in different ways, all of you in different ways. From the business end, we have employers who say they can't find the right skills. This is to say that the growth of workers is affecting their ability to grow. We hear this all the time. And the HR departments are struggling to fill vacancies for longer and longer periods of time. Jobs are just open for longer and longer periods of time. For higher education, there are few people in seats due to the drop off of the growth rate in the mid 1990s. A decrease in foreign students further impacts the bottom line because they generally pay for tuition. They also make up, by the way, a substantial portion of STEM and business studies. And there are entire programs that don't have enough candidates to survive. And you see that in my world and the MBA world. You're seeing MBA programs start to go to part time and full time programs close down. If it becomes harder for foreign students to come, or if increased competition from abroad gives them incentive to stay home or go elsewhere, school bottom lines will, and in some cases now, are suffering. And our economy of all is out on U.S. educated students in the critical fields that we need. <coughs> the other outside is for us remaking the landscape of work, of course, is technology. It's changing how we work, where we work, and most importantly, what kind of work we do. <coughs> As I go into this conversation, I want, I want to put this in context, because the threats and the opportunities inherent to this subject are very easily and very often mischaracterized. Gerald, I'm an engineer by training, that lens doesn't give me endless ways to bore people about fluid. I can, I can, we can talk about fluid mechanics all you want. But it does give me a sense of framing the subject as a whole, right? Looking at the system as a system, not individual components. So if you think about technology's role, in this case, it places technology at one point on a journey. That like humanity started on the first chisel stone into tools. From ancient Egypt to the Internet age, each advancement was laid the groundwork for the next, creating not just more ingenious invention, but faster innovation. This is the news, the natural progression of humanity's search to make life more comfortable and efficient. What is new, though, and we're all feeling it, is the pace of change, the rapid, rapid pace of change. Along this journey, jobs and industries have more to transform, they will continue to do so. Our challenge and our opportunity is how to train people to change with them. To do that, we have to understand how and where those changes are taking place. The Philadelphia Fed just published research that shows the likely effect of automation in our district, the third district, and in, and, and in the United States. In addition to identifying jobs that are in danger of automation, we assign degrees of likelihood to that happening. We also look at the people doing those jobs. Who would be hardest hit? and where new jobs would be created. We found that almost one in five jobs in our district had a 95% chance or better of becoming automated. We also found that the people most likely to be displaced are some of the economy's most vulnerable workers, women, people of color, younger people, and workers in low-skilled positions. <coughs> now, some people will be absorbed into new jobs, but there is a risk that others, others will not. Now, on with this knowledge, we can think about how to connect those workers to training and new job opportunities. The underpinning of this and other research is that while we haven't seen this exact kind of innovation before in history, we've seen the pattern. While this is jobs change, they produce other jobs. With information on how and where that will happen, we can 
to create systems that help workers, employers, and educators adapt. The changing nature of the labor market offers an opportunity to assess how they're preparing today's students for tomorrow's jobs. Again, I'm looking through that big picture lens because while technological literacy is important, I would caution against an overcorrection that disregards everything other than computer code. As we think about what skills will be necessary for the future, particularly in the context of technological advancement, we should forget that the skills, the value of the skills honed by the arts and humanities are critical. Communication, critical thinking, interpretation of intent, the wide range of subjects in a classical liberal arts education forces the mind to shift gears. And that adaptability of mind is crucial in a time of constant change. As our nation continues its march, we also lays bare the human capabilities that cannot be artificially reproduced. Much of what our nation is already displaced and the industries in which its impact will continue to grow are repetitive actions and growth knowledge that will have to be better and more efficiently than us, and always will. Artificial intelligence in its current form is not akin to the self aware how in 2001. Its output is limited to things we put into it, the input. Our comparative human advantages of creativity and individuality cannot be duplicated. At least, not yet. If that happens, you can just disregard everything I just said. <laughs> now, I have proceeded on the agenda by a panel of what higher education needs and wants of business and government. And they'll follow by a counterpart, what business and government asks of higher education. I actually think those wants and needs intersect. They absolutely intersect. The inevitability of continued technological evolution will necessitate two things. A core set of skills that can evolve at the market and a shift to constant training and continuing education. Professions will need continual upskilling, whether it's to keep up with industry standards or just learning their offices new software. While those preparing for the workforce will need both proficiency in current programs and to develop skills that will help them adapt with the technology as it will naturally evolve. From the employer's end, that means investing in the workforce and committing to lifelong learning. Simply replacing outdated skills with new ones it isn't just efficient or cost effective, it may not even be enough. The only workers who can adapt to a dynamic and regularly changing environment. And that means businesses have to commit to investment and a continued investment in people. <laughs> Educators will also need to consider new models. Not just because technology is forcing it, but because they'll be in a position to offer the lifelong learning that workers need. And I think this is where we have these needs and wants to intersect. In rethinking really models, we should also rethink mindsets. Because there are some entrenched beliefs that we need to change if we're going to successfully adapt. I just made a case for the importance of the humanities, and I do believe in their value. But I also think we place too great an emphasis on traditional four year education, particularly when it comes to employment. The other components of higher education I mentioned earlier community colleges, technical schools, training programs are equally valid sources of skilled workers, and in some cases, better suited to employers' needs. A bachelor's degree is not the only educational path to the skills employers want, though it is often required. You know, when my staff is uh, researching what we call opportunity occupations, jobs that pay at or above median wages that don't require a four-year degree, they find something interesting. Despite not requiring a degree, Employers started asking for one during the slow recovery, but how unemployment created more competition. We've seen that in a lot of sectors. And while it's returned to a large extent, the degree inflation still exists in some places. I mean, I've been shown lots of different websites that illustrate this. You know, gallons of some of the more egregious job ads say things like degree required, master's preferred, previous experience, 750 an hour, no benefits. <laughs> It makes you think. <laughs> that was aligned with the requirements and actual needs of the job to perpetuate the veneration of degrees, pedigrees, over skills. Which is a mindset I think we need to change. But it also just employers missing out on the right candidate. This reconsideration of skills and degrees is more important than ever. We have a labor market with very, very little spot and slack left. In fact, we're in an unprecedented period right now where there are more openings than people looking for jobs. So the labor market 
And, and, and the most common refrain I hear in this labor market, and I hear from employers, is they can't find people. Again, the numbers are, they're not just anecdotes. You can see this in the numbers. They just can't find the people. Now, there are very well the technological pressures are not helping us. They're not only likely to receive. We're going to need more people and people with better skills. Now, I was recently in Lancaster, PA, uh, where a visitor told me they can't get enough workers to work in a snack food place. Right? And so it's a straightforward job this person has. They're just taking pretzels off the line and putting them in a box. Right? They're paying people $17 an hour to do this. And that job, of course, doesn't require some minimal training. That's the, the tightness of the labor market in certain parts of this country. For higher education, there is an opportunity here to rethink new partnerships and models that could bring in new revenue, while at the same time better responding to the needs, the critical needs people have right now in business and industry. Now, this is really important for many institutions as demographic forces are likely to shift an increasing share of local, state, and federal budgets away from higher education and toward retirement benefits, pensions, and health care. States for federal budgets are generally calling for increased spending in fiscal 2019. And there is attention to higher education. However, the overall growth is smaller than historical averages, and there are many, many competing interests. So higher education institutions of all type, types look at their balance sheets. And consolidations and mergers increase across the sector. There are opportunities, of course, and there are risks. I know from experience that change can be a daunting proposal, especially institutions that are historically or culturally resistant to it. And the suspicion is understandable, particularly if there is a fear that quality of education is being sacrificed for revenue streams. And when too much of the debate frames education's focus on an either or proposition. There are, however, I think, new and better ways to adapt to the needs of a changing landscape without surrendering the essential characteristics that make all of our post secondary paths of study exceptional. There are many great models that both employers and educators can, can consider. Some of the most innovative, I think, have come out of community colleges. They range from working with individual businesses to give credit for outside work, the competency-based bachelor's degrees for experienced professionals. Our research here in the third third on apprenticeships has also highlighted some exceptional models. We visited, for example, recently the Philly Shipyard, and one of the participants there we met uh, range, the participants range from a woman who already had her MFA. She's doing metal art. She realized I can make a lot of money as a welder, a lot more money as a welder than as a metal artist. And so she's one of those star welders. To a man uh, in his 40s, whose Facebook page is overwhelmed by friends, he told us, asking how to get a job there. And, and they've seen his experience with this apprenticeship as he's worked, he's got his associate's degree, he's working on his bachelor's degree, all while I'm working full time. But just as importantly, we've seen apprenticeships merge not just in the traditional industries of construction and manufacturing, but increasingly in finance, IT, and in particular, healthcare. There is no traditional associated with the model that dates back to the code of Hanoi. Peter Capelli, my old colleague from Wharton, who heads up, heads up the research center there, the Center for Human Resources at Wharton, has done research on the most important lines that are on a recent graduate's resume. Number one, internships. Internships, employers are looking for experience. There are any number of partnerships that could occur both across and within sectors that could benefit everyone involved. This is especially important when a good portion of internships are still unpaid, which puts lower income students at a distinct disadvantage. While the share of internships has been rising steadily over the past couple of years, in 2017, the unpaid ones still account for more than 43%. Of internships. So, the goal of labor market forces doesn't just affect labor force participation, it plays a role in dynamism as well. The U.S. economy, if we step back and look at the U.S. economy, the U.S. economy has historically been very dynamic. But that would be the standard economics definition of turnover of businesses, jobs, and work and mobility, right? Just churn, turnover. Rather than innovation and energetic, though, eh, that, that's certainly apropos as well. But in this case, I'm just sticking with the, this sense of people moving, companies coming to, into existence and out of existence, etc. Dynamism of that type has been on the decline in America for the past 30 years or so. If we want to keep the economy from stagnating, we need as many participants in the workforce as possible. 
We also need a workforce that is adaptive and trained and ready for this changing world. There are real consequences to the skills and labor shortage. We have to think about it, talk about it in broad terms. The other high reality is that businesses can expand because of it, and dynamism falls. That in itself is obviously a pressing issue. But zeroing in on specific sectors highlights the potential for ripple effects. Take, for example, healthcare. I was recently in Wellsboro, PA. Many of you don't know where Wellsboro, PA is in the very northern tier of the state in the middle. Uh, I was meeting with business community leaders to discuss their challenges and their opportunities for economic growth. One of them was a hospital up there, the main hospital. And despite offering higher salaries than Philadelphia does for doctors and healthcare workers, not adjusted for cost of living, just pure higher salaries than you can make in Philadelphia. They are struggling to recruit people. Multiply that by cities and towns across the country facing similar skill shortages. And add to that the retirement of boomers, the retirement I mentioned a little while ago. Roughly 10,000 people turn 65 each day in the United States. A trend that started in 2011 and is likely to continue for another decade. Consider additionally that healthcare currently accounts for almost 18% of the economy and is on track to make up 20% by 2025. When you think about that growth, this puts the need for skilled workers in perspective. But given that, I think that we have an incredible opportunity. One that doesn't come, come around very often. We have a labor force with very little slack left. We have, and there's a confluence of discussions now about the future of higher education, the importance of skills, the impact of technology on our lives. And employers are asking to help, for help to get the workers they need to grow. We've got these forces coming together right now, all in the same direction. It's a perfect time to step back, see, and frame this in a, in a larger way, a bigger picture. And consider what that means for all our institutions and for the system as a whole for the next 10, 20 years. I think, given that view, this will help us to structure our education, training, and workforce to adapt as this landscape adapts, to evolve as this landscape evolves. And so I think it's a great opportunity. It's also a lot of threat, right? There's a lot of opportunity. But I think for those that can take the time to think and see the big picture, you can take advantage of that opportunity. Thank you. Question? That's exactly. Okay, questions? Yes, uh, I'm Catherine Madden from City. So, uh, a lot um, to focus on demographics as a as a constraint on the U.S. Uh, prospects for growth. Uh, you know, I whenever I hear that, it disturbs me because it sort of assumes that 60. <coughs> You know, 60 is 60, but 60 is the new 40, you know? And so the only thing that's causing people to retire is maybe business doesn't want to pay their benefits anymore. Uh, maybe they don't want to work 40 hours or more, or uh, other these, these sorts of supply side factors. And uh, so if we were to take a different view on how changes in policies and, uh, at the federal level with regard to benefits and changes in attitudes towards 40 hour full time work, wouldn't we, we, wouldn't we relax some of these constraints that are being imposed uh, by choice right. on the effective labor force? Yeah, that's a good, that's a good point. So uh, first, I think it would buy us some time. Yeah. Right? And, but it's not going to solve the fundamental problem that we're not replacing ourselves or we're <coughs> not replacing ourselves over time, right? So, and if we curtail uh, integration of various forms, uh, then that's just a double whammy. So it buy some time, but it's also, it's nuanced, right? So I'm from a family of people and pipe fitters. You cannot be a welder in your 70s. You're just physically incapable. So there's some jobs, nursing, you talk to nurses, they hit retirement age, they're just done. They're not just done physically, but emotionally. This is a really hard job. And so again, I think for, for me, I could keep doing this. I actually have a mandatory retirement date, that was said. But I think it depends on the nature of the work. Uh, for some, it would absolutely work. But again, I think the larger workers will just buy some time. It's still this long-term demographic. Uh, yeah, maybe we'll see a productivity pickup uh, with technology that will solve some of this. 
systems. There, I think it's not only a question of technology, it's also a question of societal acceptance of that technology. Right? Technology isn't always just good for its own sake, it has to be accepted. So you, look, you don't have to look far before you do it with Japan. They had, they're piloting robotic home health aids for senior citizens. Would we accept that? I don't know. I know my mother, my 93 year old mother would not. Uh, but would we accept it? Maybe we would or not. I don't know. Uh, but I think that that's one way of boosting productivity, particularly in sectors that are growing. I mean, 80% of this economy services. It's moving a lot with retail, um, really leading the way in terms of the shift away from the traditional retail job to fulfillment center jobs, right, warehousing jobs. Um, but I think it, it buys us some time. If we accept more technology into our lives, particularly in those sectors, then we can see a productivity boost. It won't be much of an issue. But Joe's out on that right now. Yes, uh, you would have the, uh, could you identify yourself? Please? Ali Mingo Road University President, given that the population of the world is growing significantly, that natural resources are diminishing significantly, and given that the technology is increasing these, making things more kind of robotics and artificial intelligence, therefore less and less and less and people end up working, really doing productive things. And and then the question is what does what does the Federal Reserve yeah. predict the future in terms of what's going to be the employment, what's going to be the food situation, the natural resources, and all of those things yeah. as, as, as Yeah, I'm not going that far. It's a good question. <laughs> uh, but I think the, the one question is closer to home, which is in this report that we just put out mm -hmm. uh, on the future of jobs and automation. We often think, and this has been true throughout human history, that what are we going to do when a machine replaces us? Well, we dream up something else. I mean, how many web designers were there 20 years ago? How many drone operators were there five years ago? I was just listening to an NPR piece. Uh, every Marine platoon now has a drone operator mechanic. Because you don't send the Marine over the hill to take a look, right? You send the drone. So we didn't have that job even a few years ago. So technology, while it will change certain work and get rid of certain jobs, it'll create new jobs. That's why the whole point about, somebody asked me, a, a, a journalist recently, how do you ensure somebody has lifelong employment? I said, you have to commit to lifelong education. I mean, it's the only way you can be assured lifelong employment in this change in the <coughs> And the natural resource issue, I tend to be more of an optimist than a pessimist, but I, uh, I think that is a concern. Uh, it's clearly a concern. <coughs> okay, two more questions? Okay. Two more. Yes, Dr. Jones. <coughs> So those of us in Philadelphia, in Philadelphia are waiting with bated breath on the Amazon decision. <laughs> so I'm wondering, we were just a bunch of us were just out in Seattle, and there's real concern about Amazon's capacity to exacerbate the equity gap between those who have versus those who don't. I wonder if the, the federal, if you, the feds, have done an analysis on what the potential impact on this region would be. Should, yeah, no, should they decide? So the report we released actually is the first one that we know of. We get your copies of this. Um, where we look at geographies across the third districts, community by community, uh, SMA by SMA, and what were the jobs that were most at risk of automation. And there are obvious things, right? Cashiers, cooks, not chefs, but cooks, right? People that say there's lots of jobs that are at risk of automation. They tend to fall uh, on that loss of job will tend to fall on people of color, women, and, and lower skilled workers. I mean, by nature. Um, as we automate the fulfillment centers, and we do more Amazon shopping, there'll be jobs, higher paying jobs, to to work in those places, to manage the facilities, to repair the robots. But that cashier job here in the center city is gone. I think it's that shift, and this is part of the problem with dynamism. It's a shift not only of the type of work, but where the work is happening. And we did recently a, an interesting study in our community development work where we partnered with uh, Northeast Pennsylvania. So Northeast Pennsylvania, you take Scranton as an example. This is a city Thomas Edison first electrified and built a transit system in and out of to bring people in and out of the city. All of the jobs for low-income people who live in the city are out on the highways, truck repair jobs, rehab, fulfillment center jobs, and so forth. They don't have cars to get there, especially second and third shift. And the three transit agencies that are there uh, have a hard time meeting that demand. So we put together for a year, we did some modeling, we, we worked with Wilkes University there to help uh, train them and work with us on how to think about this. 
We organized the conference. We better not solve the problem. What I really like about this story and the end of the story is one of the main employers out there, Geisinger Health, uh, they, they joined in right away because they knew they had this issue. They were trying to get lower skilled people to, the work, to work. But then they went a step further. They said, you know, if the way reimbursements are happening in healthcare today, if somebody misses an appointment, that costs us money. They worse off, we're worse off. So they developed this and the piloting and appointment navigator, where they will help somebody figure out how to get on transit to the appointment. And if there's a last mile or so they can't close, they pay for it. They send an Uber, they send a van. And so and they think this is economically uh, worthwhile for them. It's that kind of, then we have a couple other cities coming in to be trained on how to do this. It's a, we think it's a generic problem a lot of these communities have, where they've got work, it's just no longer in the place it once was. Right? So I think this is where we have to think systematically. Right? We can't just think of a job training program here and not do it. And we have this problem in Philadelphia, King of Prussia. Lots of jobs in King of Prussia, but people can't get there easily and also drop their kids off at daycare, pick their kids up at daycare, and, and live life. Right? So it's that kind of thinking where we have to think holistically, of not just the, creating the job and creating the skills for jobs, but creating the infrastructure. Because if you can't live near a job, or you can't get to a job, or in the case of like a reservoir, you don't have broadband access, a job can't get to you, you don't have a job. Right? And everybody loses. Okay. One last question. Wait, to me. Oh, sorry. Hi, I'm Ashley Murphy from Vanguard. Um, a third of our business is in the 401k space, which presumes that um, individuals have a sponsor who's willing to give them money to invest and help yeah. them invest. And I'm just thinking in terms of the dynamics of ongoing education and then being able to retire on time. How does one fund that, especially when um, workforce dynamics are changing and you have more independent workers, gig economy, talent economy, dynamics like that. Yeah. So I think, and I say I, and I'll, in this case I won't speak for the bank, I think and we think that we have to not only put our burden on the individual, but also on the employers who need this, these workers. And that problem's not going away. And so traditionally we thought of workforce development as a social good, right? It's a social program. We're helping people. We have to turn that thinking around. Last year we had a conference, a system-wide conference the Fed in Austin on workforce development. And I think the message out of that report uh, was stop thinking of it as a social program. Think of it as investment. And so we are piloting right now, and we're hearing more about this uh, in subsequent months, with the city of Philadelphia and some other major players here, uh, a different kind of program where companies will be investing money, there means some seed capital is being put in, companies will be investing money in uh, workforce development here, both with some generic skills, particularly digital skills and literacy, so it's really, you know, numeracy, literacy, generally, and digital literacy, and then some job-specific skills, and then the companies will get a return on investment from that, and will put more money in as they get employed and pay these out. It's just changing the model, right? So it is unrealistic to think that somebody can do this completely on their own, given how tight, particularly for low and moderate income communities, how tight their money is. And also, employers have to give up some time to make this happen, too. It's not just treasure, it's time, right? They have to build time into their employees' day to get that retraining. I think that mindset shift is something that we're starting to see happen. We're starting like I said, piloted here in the city. I think we're going to see more and more of that across the country. As the, market, the labor market is not going to get very slack anytime soon. I mean, we're looking at, we're now down 3.7% unemployment. We're forecasting we'll get to 3.5 uh, next year, probably, before we start heading back up a little bit. But we're, it's a very tight labor market. So I think employers have to start thinking differently, as well as employees. Thank you. Thank you.